All right, well, we'll go ahead and get, get started. Um, I'm Dr. Rosalind Biggs. I am a beef cattle extension specialist uh, with both, both with OSU Extension as well as uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine. And so we are now in the third week of our cattle health uh, series for, for our ranchers lunchtime meetings. And it's my pleasure this morning, or I guess we're in the afternoon now, uh, to introduce Dr. Meredith Jones that's going to be speaking to us on, on cattle lameness. Just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we again want to welcome you and uh, just keep in mind uh, we would ask uh, all, all attendees are muted, but if you have questions, you're welcome to put those in the, the chat or the Q&A and Dr. Jones and I will do our best to, to get those perhaps answered during the presentation, but we'll leave enough time at the end to address those as well. So we want to, to thank everybody for, for joining us. And um, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and, and introduce Dr. Jones. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be, have the opportunity to work with Dr. Jones. She's an associate professor at Oklahoma State uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. She received her DVM here at OSU in 2002 and then entered a private mixed animal practice in Kentucky. She then returned to OSU to complete a residency in, in large animal internal medicine with an emphasis on food animal. She received her master's in veterinary biomedical sciences here at OSU during that time and is currently a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine uh, large animal. She previously taught uh, food animal field services at both Kansas State University as well as Texas A&M and their colleges of veterinary medicine. And she rejoined us here at uh, at OSU, uh, much to the delight of uh, the veterinary community and producers in the fall of 2018. I, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Jones is, is great to work with here. Uh, she's also a, a fellow aficionado of Dr. Pepper, which I can appreciate. And I have mine, I have mine ready to go too. So with that, uh, we will we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Jones, and um, let you start that share, screen share. Terrific, thanks Dr. Biggs. Um, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Biggs back as well. She's a new addition, came back home just like I did. I think we all kind of wandered to other jobs and then waited to just have the opportunity to come right back where we belonged. So um, very glad to be here and glad to be with you all today. Um, thanks for uh, joining us. And so um, we decided that um, I would address um, lameness and in fact the reason I'm dressed like I am is because I just finished uh, working on a cow's foot that um, looks a lot like the feet that you're about to see um, uh, in this presentation and so lameness as you know is um, tremendously costly in the really the beef cattle industry across the board uh, but in cow calf we see tremendous issues both in the cows and the bulls we certainly see issues in um, in our calves as well but uh, in the in the uh, adult mama cows and in the bulls we see tremendous amounts of issues and we are fortunate here at OSU um, we have there are four of us uh, myself and three of my partners that um, actually really enjoy lameness work. Uh, we have two tipping hydraulic chutes that make lameness work um, at least humane on our bodies. And so uh, we do a, a tremendous amount of work here um, uh, on bull and cow feet. So um, today's topics, just to kind of give you an outline, obviously I could talk for days about lameness. There's um, many, many things that cause it. But what I did was I kind of picked out the things that we see most commonly here in our clinic or that I talk to veterinarians and producers about on the phone um, and some common points of confusion that we see uh, where people you know kind of pick one diagnosis and that's maybe just not quite right um, that it should be another one and we're going to you know talk a, a little bit about how to differentiate some of those things for you at home uh, so you know what to be prepared for and can properly identify those so we're going to talk about foot rot deep, deep digital infection um, some regional antibiotic treatments that we can use for that we have some current research going on here uh, in our clinic we're going to talk about corns real quick corkscrew claw and then finally we're going to talk about fractures uh, just briefly so um, 
This is foot rub. This is exactly what. Dr. Jones. Rub. Yes, ma'am. I think we've got a. It, it, your sh your screen isn't showing quite yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought that it looked funny. Try it. Try it now. Uh, there, there we go. We're almost set. I can see see your laptop screen there. So just so long as you put it in the, and I apologize. I think that's probably my error. Um, okay, it says I'm screen sharing. So can you see like my super junky laptop with all kinds of stuff on it? Okay. You got it. <laughs> all right. All right. Like mine. Let me try again. There we go. Perfect. That actually looks better for me too. Okay, I'm glad that you said something. I apologize for that crew. It, I knew it didn't behave quite right when I shared, uh, but I really didn't know what to do about it. So, um, so this is classic foot rot. So we're looking, of course, at the bottom of a foot. This is tipped up on our hydraulic chutes where we can see the bottom of that foot really easy. This is the part that's hard for you all to see at home when you're looking at them, uh, unless you pick up the foot with a rope in, a, in your chute and, and take a look at it. Um, and so what foot rot really is, is a bacterial infection here between the toes, right in the center there. And of course, moisture and all these kinds of things really predispose to this. If you were to look at the front of this foot with her standing up, as you know, you're gonna see a lot of swelling all the way around the foot, right up above the coronary band, right where the hoof wall is gonna meet the skin there's gonna be a fair amount of swelling around that. And it's important to note that that swelling, <coughs> excuse me, will be all the way around the foot. So all the way around and will be pretty uniform all the way around. Now, the difference that I need you to know is remember that and then look at these feet. So, if you look, um, what I just finished working on looks like the foot in the middle, actually. But if you look at these left two feet, with what I just said about foot rot, I hope that you're able to appreciate that these are not foot rot. So they may have started as foot rot, but you notice that there in each foot, there is one claw that is um, inflamed and where they're swelling at the coronary band at that skin hoof junction and the other claw looks pretty normal. With foot rot both claws are going to be swollen. This is almost always infection of the joint what we call the distal interphalangeal joint. It's this joint on your finger and of course on a cow the hoof is around this where you have a fingernail, that's your hoof. And so we get a lot of infections we see in that first knuckle, basically. And it's kind of sunk down in that hoof a little bit, about on the average cow, maybe three quarters of an inch or so down from the junction there is where that joint actually sits. So it's actually down in the hoof, kind of like it's in a little cast. And so you can imagine if that joint gets infected, and it is inside this hard capsule of the hoof and it starts to swell, you can imagine how incredibly painful that would be uh, because you just got the swelling in this enclosed space. And so that's why the swelling kind of sort of bubbles up above the hoof wall and looks like this. Now, at home, you can most of the time easily treat a foot rot. Most of us know oxytetracycline, um, Draxin, Nuflo, we got lots of things that are labeled for foot rot. And foot rot typically, if it's just an uncomplicated foot rot, will usually respond to one dose of any of the labeled antibiotics for that. You just flip over the bottle, look at the label, if it says foot rot on it, you're good to go. Um, and an uncomplicated foot rot, you give her one shot of that, three or four days down the road, they should be walking right out of that and be great. If they don't walk out of it by three to five days, there's something else going wrong. Now, there is such a thing as super foot rot. I want you to put that out of your mind. <laughs> uh, super foot rot happens, you know, one in every 
10 million cases of foot rot. It's just, we just don't see foot, super foot rot that some people refer to. What we do see in our clinic every single day are these two feet on the left that have a septic joint. Now you might say, oh, if it's infected, why doesn't the antibiotic help with that? Well, the problem is once you have infection like that and it's kind of chronic, it's been going on a while by the time it looks like this, antibiotics can't get in there anymore. And when bones or joints are infected, it is virtually impossible to get antibiotics in there. There are some techniques that we can use, but giving her a shot in the neck is not gonna get antibiotic into this joint where it needs to be. And so these, I, what I want you to learn to do is on these lamenesses, which most of them are gonna be in the foot, I want you to kind of train yourself and get in the habit of looking at, at that foot from the front, just like these pictures and get into the habit of training yourself is that whole thing swollen or is it one claw over the other and if it is one claw over the other your veterinarian or i or somebody needs to hear about it um, because there needs to be more done here there's going to need to be more work done or if you give a dose of a foot rot antibiotic and they don't respond in three to five days we, your veterinarian also needs to hear about that um, because it means there's something else going on. And the other common thing we see are these two right hand feet where they've got sole ulcers. So this is where um, the, the hoof has been, the sole has been thinned on the bottom of the foot. There's kind of a pressure point right there where that hole is and infection has gotten up underneath there and it's bruised. And that, those will make cattle incredibly lame and they usually don't have any swelling at all. Um, so that, those two feet would be ones where you would say, okay, it's fair to try to treat them for foot rot at home. But again, three to five days, she's not better. A veterinary needs to know about it um, to, so we can flip that foot up and see um, what else is going on. And so, you know, for me, the big deal, the reason I spend so much time on this is we get so many of them in that they've been lame for six or eight or weeks or, you know, God forbid, even longer than that. And they never had a chance of getting better uh, because people were using systemic antibiotics, injectables, um, and those just, you know, can't get the job done with these other problems. Uh, and so jump on these early, that way they don't come in where, to me, where they're, they've already lost a bunch of weight um, they've been suffering this whole time. It's just a really important animal welfare thing to think about. These feet are painful, painful. All right, so deep digital sepsis is what those two left-hand feet had. Um, again, that infection in that kind of first finger joint down there. And this picture on the left is just joint fluid from an infected joint. Joint fluid should be clear as glass, just water. Um, and so this is sign of infection in here that it's thick and yellow and it's got some yuck at the bottom of it. And we can also x-ray these as well to help us make that diagnosis. And I think you can, so what we're doing is we're x-raying that foot looking straight on. You can kind of take an image that that is a picture of my two fingers sticking down uh, just like a cow's foot. And on this, the one that I'm kind of focused on, you can see above the hoof, where the second bone up from the bottom is, there's some soft tissue swelling around it. It kind of bulges out and is round like that. That's that skin swelling that you saw in those last feet. And then we are able then to look at the joint space between the bottom bone and the next bone up. And we say, it's, and you see it's kind of, you can't see a nice black line like you can see in the joint above that. And that tells us there's infection in that joint and that we're gonna to have to be a lot more aggressive um, than, than just simple antibiotic treatment. Um, so one of our first treatment options, and many of you all may have had your veterinarian do this for you, you may have had an animal in your herd that needed to have this done, is claw amputation. And claw amputation has some advantages and some disadvantages that were probably presented to you um, if you had to make this decision. 
Um, and so the picture on the right is a cow that has had um, one claw amputated. So that claw had infection in the deeper structures of the foot, so more than foot rot. And we have a couple options and, and we elected claw amputation. Claw amputation is a relatively low cost procedure. It provides virtually instant pain relief. And I know that's kind of hard to believe. You're looking at that picture and you're like, that thing's in pain. Well, let me tell you, when you've had infection down in your hoof under all that pressure, and then you remove that, the pain from the surgery is so much less than the pain from all that pressure that those cows are happy right away. Now, we do still provide them with pain relief, but those animals will walk out of the chute sound um, because having that infection just removed from their body is so helpful. The big downside of claw amputation is that those are not associated with a lot of longevity. So those animals are not likely to remain in the herd for years. So we like to reserve it for um, a cow that's maybe six months pregnant and we need to get her out to where she has the calf and raises it. Or we've got a bull where we need him to just finish out the breeding season, some things like that. Um, there may be other um, opportunities for us to make those decisions. Um, but in general, we don't get them out usually much past about a year. You can see the second statistic I have there, bulls out to 27 months. That's pretty unusual. And my guess is a lot of those were front feet. Uh, as you can imagine, taking a toe off a back foot of a bull um, who is in natural service um, is is associated with a very short lifespan as well. So usually in beef cattle, what we're trying to do is get them to a production goal. Have the calf, raise the calf, um, you know, those types of things. Those are our timelines rather than like a set set of months, for example. So this is what one of those toes looks like when you cut it off. So I have split this with a bandsaw in the middle and you can see the kind of triangle bone. It's a little hard. I can't really point for you, but there's kind of this triangle bone that looks like the toe. You can see the, the bottom down there is the sole that they walk on and then the hoof wall over to the right. And so that bottom bone, triangle bone that you're seeing is this bone in your finger. And then at that joint, you can see in there where there's just, it's just nasty and gross before you get to the bone at the top. And the bones there are kind of burned where I put them through the bandsaw, so you kind of have to look through that. Um, but in that kind of curved space in between them, pus and pro protein and all kinds of yuck. And it is just excruciatingly painful, very, very serious problem. And antibiotics will not go into that space. So we do have claw sparing procedures. So we use these in bulls. For example, where we would really like for him to stick in the herd for a while, um, valuable cows, embryo flush type cows, you know, genetically valuable animals who really need eight toes and need them for a while. <laughs> and so we can do surgery on them and you look at the left and you're like, that doesn't really look like much surgery. Um, it's kind of cow surgery. Um, we can actually take a drill bit and drill through that joint, and then we can flush through there, and we can flush antibiotics in there. Remember I said the bloodstream can't get it there, but we can put it there if we make a hole. And so what we do is, is we actually destroy that joint. They heal those two bones back together, just like they would if it was a bone that broke. They heal those back together, and then they become sound. It takes about eight weeks for all that to happen. It's a longer recovery. Those claw amputation cows are back like that. These take a little longer, but for a valuable animal that needs to be around for a while, we do have options to get them through this. So I don't want you to get the impression when I'm talking about how serious this is, I don't want you to get the impression that there's just no hope. Um, you might as well ship her kind of thing. Um, we do have options um, in certain situations. So. And we are happy um, to, you know, you guys take these to your local veterinarian. Um, he or she may be really experienced with these kinds of things. 
Um, we are happy to talk to them about it. I talk a lot of people through this surgery um, on the phone and that's part of our what we do here is not only do we provide you guys with information, but we will also happily talk to your veterinarian and um, help them um, to help you. And so that's one of our major goals is not that you necessarily bring everything to us, um, but that we help you um, get really great service from your local veterinarian. So um, you might think, hey, it might kind of hurt if somebody took a drill bit and drilled it through my finger going sideways. Well, you would be right. And so what we have is the ability to anesthetize just the foot. So it's very expensive to anesthetize a whole cow or a whole bull. But we have the opportunity, if they're restrained in the chute, to just numb the foot. And the way we do this is we put a tourniquet around it, and then we hit a vein with a needle, and then we eject lidocaine, just like you hear about dentists using, um, into that foot. And I'm gonna go ahead and start this video. And this cow's gonna jump, which is what they always do initially. You can see kind of at the top left down at the bottom of that foot, there's kind of a bloody spot there where we've been working on that. Um, and so it's gonna be painful. And so now we're gonna anesthetize the foot. And so you see there's a little bit of blood comes back underneath that yellow looking thing. We just make some adjustments until we get lined up and you see blood comes right out of that. That means we are in that vein. Then what we can do is we can inject the anesthetic directly into that vein and everything below the tourniquet will be totally numb. So we can dig a hole in that foot if we need to. We can cut one of those toes off if we need to. We can do anything we want to that foot and they won't feel it. Um, and the tourniquet is just out of your vision there. Obviously this animal's on a chute, you just can't see it, but it's up um, a few inches higher than what you can see on that leg. We can also use these, this procedure to put antibiotics in, and that will help push antibiotics into places of infection where normally just an injection into the neck won't go. And so we do have a variety of antibiotics that we can do that with. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any products that are labeled for that. So everything we do in that way is gonna be extra label. Um, so it has to be done on the order of a veterinarian. We do have information and PK is pharmacokinetics. That means the way a drug moves through the body. And so that's one of the first things we always have to learn about a drug is when we put it in someplace, what does it do in the body? We have information about one, two, three, four, five, six antibiotics and what they do when put in a foot under a tourniquet. One, two, three, four of those have X's by them because they are either illegal for us to use in this way or uh, one of them, the tetracycline, is we don't even have a product available in the US that is that particular tetracycline. So four of them come right off the list out of the top. And so we're left with two. Um, and as you might imagine, that's pretty limiting. Uh, you know, we would like to have more options um, than just two. Each of those do a great job, um, but they each have their drawbacks like most things do in life. So we have got some research going on in our clinic. I alluded to it a little bit earlier, um, where we are looking at more drugs that we could use in a foot. So for example, if we know for some reason that one of those two drugs that we have left isn't gonna work, do we have another option? Um, and so we actually have two projects going on um, where we are taking cows, uh, mature beef cows, and we are doing this regional intravenous injection into the foot with different antimicrobials, and we are doing that PK, how does it move through the body kind of work. And what that allows us to do then is we can determine, first of all, does the antibiotic get to the place of infection at a high enough dose or concentration that it has a chance of actually killing the bugs that we, you know, the bacteria that we know are there. And second, we need to know a withdrawal time for that, right? 
we always got to know what a withdrawal time is. And so that's the purpose of this research is what antibiotics might work better. And if we use those drugs for these problems, how long, you know, are we married to that cow or bull before we can send them down the road? And of course, the goal is that using these drugs will significantly delay uh, sending them down the road. That's what obviously uh, what we're trying to do. So um, are there any, I'm just going to, Dr. Biggs, are there any questions about kind of that first section before I move on? No questions just yet in the chat, but we will remind attendees if you're interested in a question, you can put that in the Q&A uh, or the chat feature, uh, whichever works works best for you. And uh, we would take those at this time or we will wait until the very end. And please feel free to ask questions. That's what I'm here for. I love to answer your questions. And so we wanna make sure that these presentations are what you want to know about. And so if you've got questions about these things, don't, don't be shy and there's no such thing as a dumb question. So don't feel like um, you're gonna be embarrassed by what you ask, because I guarantee you uh, somebody else needs to know that answer too. So um, feel free. So corns. Um, you look at this left-hand foot, that's a very mild, small corn. Most of you are probably looking at that thinking, oh, that's no corn. I've seen corn. <laughs> um, this middle foot is kind of more of a typical corn um, that we are starting surgery on. So if you just, you know, spend your life looking at cow feet, um, you will see there are a lot of animals in the world, especially beef animals, that have corns that have these little kind of wart looking growths uh, between their toes uh, that look just like this. And those animals never become lame. Great big, you'll see great big heavy Hereford bulls and they'll have these great big old growths between their toes and those bulls never become lame for them. And that's the case with most corns. Most corns never cause a problem with an animal. When it's time to remove a corn to do something about it is, if the animal becomes lame on that foot, first of all, if it's lame, we, you know, we need to get that foot picked up and, and, or put in a chute and see what's going on. And if you see the, that lame foot and you look and there's a corn, you at home are gonna be suspicious. I wonder if this corn's the problem. So what happens is people see a lame animal at home, Maybe they try foot rot treatment, it fails, and then they bring them in either to their local veterinarian or to us, and we flip the cow over and we look at this foot and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's, if, it's, if the problem's in the foot, and if so, what's the problem in the foot? The problem, even if they have a corn, the lameness is not always caused by that. Again, a lot of animals have corns and their corns never cause them a problem. The only time a corn is causing a problem and needs to be removed is when one of a couple of things are happening. One is it has grown so much that it's coming in contact with the ground and therefore it's getting rubbed and getting a raw spot on the bottom of it. So you can picture how you got this thing hanging down between your toes and it's rubbing on the ground and that's just skin. And so it hurts, that's painful. A corn, that, that, a corn that's getting rubbed on the ground needs to come out because it is gonna be chronically painful. The other thing is, is when from kind of the sides, you can see how that thing fits like a wedge between those toes. Is it being rubbed on either side of that V? You know, up against the hoof wall, is it getting rubbed? And so, if you watch, if you watch me look at a corn, I'm gonna pinch all over that corn. I'm gonna look in there with a flashlight and I'm gonna see if it's getting rubbed and raw. And then I'm gonna take my fingers and then I'm gonna pinch it. And if I pinch it and she says, ow, then that's a corn that needs to come off. So either rubbed raw, either on the bottom or on the sides, or is painful when I pinch it, then that's a corn that needs to come off. Other corns don't need to come off. I have a lot of people come and say, oh, I noticed this corn in this bull and I want it off. Well, 
if it's not causing him a lameness, I would argue that you are putting him through surgery unnecessarily and that you've got a risk of infection there and that kind of thing from where we cut that thing off. And so we heartily discourage um, removing a corn that is not painful. So this middle is um, obviously the, um, where we've got a scalpel blade there and we've got some clamps up at the top. We're kind of holding that thing and we're gonna surgically remove it. And then the right hand picture is about really about five days down the road that it's and it's a big hole when it starts i didn't include that picture for, just for room but there's a great big hole we leave between those toes when we remove that corn and then in just a few days it contracts down um, and you just have a little wound like that generally heals right over without complication um, and then that animal goes right on they are at risk of growing them again is the only problem. We don't really know what causes corns. We think it's chronic irritation, like animals that are on uneven ground and their, their two toes kind of ride like this and are kind of uneven all the time, that maybe that chronic irritation between them uh, makes the animal sort of produce this thing just to kind of try to hold that area um, in place. Uh, at the end of the day, we really don't know. Um, but again, not all corns need to come off for sure. Um, I want to talk about corkscrew claw because we see this a lot, especially in, um, well, I hate to say it, but in a lot of Angus uh, cattle have corkscrew claw. Um, and what you can see in these, of course, the right picture is a much more mild version. The, uh, I'm sorry, the left-hand picture, now I don't remember what I said. Left-hand picture is the mild one, the right-hand picture is the more severe. Um, and that is where it's almost always the outside claw on the back and it will curve in like this and sometimes as you can see even cross over that inside claw. What is also happening is that the outside wall that you can you know the side of the hoof that you can see it also grows down and underneath and you really can't appreciate that from the top. Sometimes if you've got them on concrete or whatever you can kind of see that hoof start to kind of curve under there but you really don't um, necessarily see the impact of that. And the reason I want you to know about that is um, these two feet on the right, neither of those has corkscrew claw, but those giant holes in the bottom, corkscrew claw causes that problem, can cause that. Other things can too. Um, but what happens is that that outside wall curves under and they walk on the wall. And that's just not how they were designed to walk. And it puts pressure up on their sole and that hurts. And eventually it gets so bruised that they become very lame. And so corkscrew claw is a big concern um, in the beef industry because it is believed that there is some heritability associated with that. And so you might imagine that having seed stock animals with a foot confirmation like this is, we don't want it. We don't want heifers out of a bull that has this, you know, those types of things. Um, and so whenever we diagnose particularly a bull with this condition, I always recommend to the owner, I, we trim them up so that they're comfortable and try to make them look a little better. We can't ever make them look perfect. Um, but I always tell them, you know, I really am going to encourage you to sell this bull and not keep genetics out of him. You can, or you can keep him and use him as a terminal bull if you want to do that, but he's going to need foot trims about three or four times a year. Otherwise that thing's going to grow under and he's just going to get lame and lame and lame. We can keep him maybe from getting lame very often by doing regular foot trims on him. Um, so again, I would encourage um, folks to treat these animals as they need to have terminal genetics. Um, I will put one little asterisk on that. Typically, we only call it corkscrew claw if it is both feet. If it's only one foot, a lot of times that can be injury related. And so we wouldn't, you know, so we are careful to differentiate those and we will tell you this is only one foot, so I think it's not the genetic version of this. You can plug on, but we probably are gonna still need to trim the foot periodically because the foot shape hasn't changed. But if it's both feet, um, we're gonna really encourage you to make that a terminal. 
terminal genetics. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about were fractures. So they're kind of the thing that doesn't really fit in so far. We've been really focused on the foot, which is where most things are. But when I was thinking about, gosh, what things do I wish beef producers knew at home and had kind of as just walking around everyday knowledge, I thought, ugh, fractures, I, you know, make good decisions about fractures. A lot of cattle fractures are fixable, especially in babies, but even up to pretty good sized ones. And so um, I wanted you to, to make you aware of that first. A lot of these we can fix. So I have this, my little cartoon diagram that I made just for you down here on the right of this. I'm using this calf as a model, but this is true all the way up to, you know, 2000 pound bull, although there are obviously other issues about a 2000 pound bull. But in general, if the break is below the knee or the hock, the carpus or the hock, where that first bottom orange line is, below there, those can very often be fixed and very often at relatively low cost, especially in a baby. I would, uh, if I had a baby that had a fracture below those two areas, for sure I'm taking it to a veterinarian because there's a really good chance that we're gonna have a good outcome on that. If it is in that next section up, so between the two orange lines, between the knee and the elbow, and between the uh, hawk and the stifle, those are fixable sometimes, you know, a good amount of the time, sometimes they're not fixable. So they're kind of this middle, we need to make a call. Um, if they are above the stifle or the elbow, sometimes we can get those to recover, but we have no way to stabilize the fractures up there. So ones that are that high, we can't put a cast on them, we can't put a splint on them, we can't do anything, nothing works up there. And so in general, if you come to us and if you call me and you say it's above the stifle or if it's above the elbow, I'm gonna tell you over the phone, uh, you know, it probably needs to be a super valuable animal for us to even really try that because it's going to be a much more complicated fix uh, than something down below. And so this is just a really good picture, I think, to have in your mind when you call your veterinarian with a broken leg. They're going to want to know where it is, probably over the phone. And so if you can say it's below the knee or it's below the hawk or it's above the hawk, above the knee, that is really going to be helpful for them over the phone to say, yep, there's a good chance we can fix that or no, is we're probably not going to be able to fix that. Now, all of that is only true if the bone is not exposed. So there's always a chance, particularly on those lower ones, you know, like if you look at my arm, I got some muscle up here, not very much, and I've got, you know, I'm pretty bony with not a lot of coverage down here. And the same with this calf, you know, he starts to get muscle up here, he doesn't have much down here. Because of that, these low ones are likely to kind of flop a little bit and you run the risk of having the bone poke through. Um, and so the game changes if you see bone sticking out of skin or you see blood at the place where the fracture is. And so we need to know that too. If you say, oh, it's below the knee, but I do see some blood on it, then that, if it's open, if the fracture is open like that, um, the chance of infection is very high. And so that's gonna change our story a little bit. Now, the best thing you can do on your end with one of those to keep it from opening up while you've got them in a trailer or in the truck floorboard trying to get them to your veterinarian is splint it at home. And I do not care what you use. One time when I was in practice, I had somebody bring me a dog and they had um, used coloring pencils and they had taped all these coloring pencils all around the dog's leg. Well, it worked. It just needs to be something rigid. And so lengthwise split PVC pipe, one by four, two by four, whatever you got, place that around the bone above and below where you know the break is. So if the break's right here, Make sure that splint goes down to here and goes up to here, and then just duct tape the fire out of it. 
up here in the top right is how you want to do that. You want it to be able, I'm going to pretend my wrist is a broken bone. You need to stop the bone from going like this, and you need to stop the bone from going like this, side to side. So you don't put a board on one side and a board on the opposite side. You put a board on one side and you do a board 90 degrees from it, if that makes sense. And that way you stop both side to side and you stop kind of front and back. And so that is, you get that on there, we are not gonna laugh at your splint job um, because you've probably saved that animal's life by keeping that from, by keeping that bone from poking out um, while during the trailer ride and during transition. So that was kind of the last topic I wanted to cover. Um, I, real quick, before we start answering questions, I just wanna again make clear that um, our job here is both to see cases that need to be seen uh, here in Stillwater. Um, we have a clinic for, that's a full service clinic. Um, we also take in cases that your veterinarian examines and says, I think it needs to go somewhere else for treatment. That's also what we're here for. Um, but our number one goal is that you're gonna use your local veterinarian um, to help you make decisions, help you design herd health plans, help you, um, uh, with individual animal kinds of things, and then we are always here uh, to back both of you up um, in those situations. So um, I, I see that there are two Q&As and then I see some more, so. Um. Yeah, so we've got a couple of questions in, in the Q&A. Um, might start with the chat questions. Talk to us a little bit more about foot rot as far as what are our what leads us to foot rot as a general rule? Is it, is it an injury? Is it weather conditions? Right. Uh, what are our predisposing factors that get us, to, get us to foot rot? Yeah, so I don't know the makeup of our audience, like how many people in the audience soak in the bathtub for a long time after a hard day. <laughs> but, but if you think about when you do soak in the bathtub or you wash the dishes, um, you know, when you pull your hand out of that water, it's been in there for a while, your skin is really wrinkly. Well, if you did that for a really, really long time, what that does is that breaks down the integrity of your skin. So right now, you know, if I touch a bacteria with my intact skin, my skin is going to protect me from getting an infection. That's part of my immune system is my skin. When that gets either you know, kind of torn up a little bit from being too wet, or it can be, you know, staking a stob into there or whatever. That allows a bacteria that is very common. Well, actually, it's always in cow manure. So this bacteria is all over your pasture because there's cattle manure all over your pasture. And with that skin not functioning like it should, that bacteria now has a chance to get in because obviously they're walking through manure all the time. And so we really will see foot rot outbreaks almost always after a big rain. Maybe you got a place in your pasture that holds it and maybe that's close to the feeder or something where they tend to congregate. And so we most often see it associated with water breaks down the immune barrier of the skin and then that bacteria that's just everywhere um, anyway, so there's nothing you can do to get rid of the bacteria. It's there. It's just about keeping cattle feet dry as best you can to keep that skin functioning like it should. So talk to us a little bit. Uh, we've got participants really from uh, across, across Oklahoma, and we even have some participants from out of state uh, recognizing some of those names on our attendee list. So uh, but we do have a fair amount of fescue on in certain parts of of Oklahoma. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so talk to us a little bit about fescue foot uh, versus maybe other symptoms that, that we should be looking at there. Yeah, that's a great question because it's something I didn't put in just for time. So what fescue can do if it is endophyte infected um, is it, the endophyte toxin causes the blood vessels to constrict. So, you know, your blood vessels are normally, let's say they're this open all the time to serve blood to all the parts of your body. 
And what that toxin on fescue can do is it makes those blood vessels do this, particularly at the end of the tail and particularly at the feet. So kind of your terminal places in your body where the blood vessels are the smallest already. And then that makes them shrink down even more. And so what we see with fescue foot is um, it's really a death of that tissue, what we call necrosis. And so that tissue that is not, that now doesn't have any blood supply starts to die because it doesn't have any blood supply. And so the lesion, what you see in a foot with fescue foot is basically dead tissue developing. So it is different. It, it is a rotten foot. So it, you know, you, you may be tempted to call it foot rot, but there's no question it's a rotten foot. Um, but it's from a different cause. It's from a lack of blood flow. Um, and as probably many of you all have experienced, the sensitivity to fescue varies. Um, not every animal, you know, who's on the same pasture reacts the same. And that's the same for sort of getting into slumber slump, summer slump kind of issues, you know, with fescue and that kind of thing. Um, and so one of the things that's important if you're in a place where you're kind of married to fescue is there's some genetic selection that can happen there that can make your genetics over time more resistant to fescue. Because at the end of the day, endophyte free fescue doesn't last very long. And, um, but yeah, they, it does cut off the blood supply to the feet. And sometimes you'll see them slough the tail and they can even slough the tips of their ear. We see that more with uh, frostbite, but that can happen as well. Good question. So Dr. Jones, just in case we'll remind everybody, if you have a question, uh, you're certainly welcome to put those in the Q&A or, or the chat. Uh, while, we're, while we're maybe waiting on those last one or two, oh, thanks Dr. Lohman, I think uh, launched our polls for us. We're, we're launching our polls here. If you'll take just a moment and, and vote, on, vote on those. We're looking for uh, really what your knowledge was, kind of when we started, started this, what you're seeing in your operation now that helps us both in extension as well as uh, Dr. Jones mentioned a number of the research efforts that are going on here at the College of Veterinary Medicine. So this is just real informal. If you'll, if you'll answer those for us, uh, we'll take, take a quick look. Dr. Biggs. Yes, sir. Let me just make one comment, <clears throat> please. Uh, I think it might be helpful for the audience to recognize or to know that these are uh, this is recorded anonymously. I have not been mentioning that, and I'm a little afraid that some folks may think that their name will show up beside their answers, and that's not the case. These are completely anonymous. Yes, uh, thanks, Dr. Lohman. I think that's really important. Uh, we we're, we just really kind of want to know want to know where you're at, but uh, we're, we certainly don't want to to pick on anybody. And so you're again. Your answers are, are completely anonymous. Uh, we don't know who who is who, and uh, how many how many folks uh, have have participated uh, with that. So, all right. Well, we're getting some. We've we've got uh, a little over half of the half of our participants have have voted here. Dr. Jones, I'm not seeing any other questions in, okay. in the chat. Um, I have one, Dr. Biggs. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. If you don't mind sharing my screen, I would like to show you the images uh, from the American Angus Association with their foot scoring system where they have developed EPDs uh, for the uh, purpose of uh, improving on this problem. Uh, and I'd like to have you comment if you don't mind. <laughs> Oh, All right, that's so, a big spot to be put in. <laughs> Dr. Jones, while we're doing that, if you if you don't mind bringing your screen share down, we'll I let can. Dr. Lawman. Yes, ma'am. All right, and so while Dr. Lawman is bringing those images up, talk to us a little bit more about corkscrew claw. Excuse me, corkscrew claw, and and really when if we're looking at if if we're looking at new genetics. When should we be able to determine that? What's what's our age that we should feel confident? Oh, good about? question. That's an excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up. So this is um, actually maybe, in my opinion, the worst part of corkscrew claw is that it doesn't show up very early, um, and so because of that, uh, the genetics is a is a mess. 
um, a lot of times you will not see this start to form and I'm going to, and I'm going to put this on bulls a lot only because if a bull's got bad genes, then you got much bigger problems than if you got one cow in your herd that has, you know, a genetic or heritable type problem. So, um, that bull who, you know, who has a predisposition to having corkscrew claw, you may never notice even a hint of it until he hits three. And of course, by then he has put his genetics in a lot of cows, particularly if he's an AI sire. And so that is, that is one of the big problems with corkscrew claw is that their feet may be beautiful uh up until the age of three or four or five when they really start to grow and really show you what they're going to look like so dr lawman we're not quite seeing those those images yet i don't know if we're having some problems again with our with our screen share we are <laughs> okay so give me just a second we do have another question that came in um talk to us a little bit dr jones about chronic chronic cracks in feet and um, how, how's the best way to, to address those? Um, what, what should we be doing on, on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. Um, so what I'm going to talk about are the vertical hoof cracks. So, you know, if this is the hoof and this is the sole down at the bottom, these cracks that come up towards the coronary band, usually they're on right on that front side of that foot. And I'm assuming that that's what the asker is thinking about because we do see those a lot here. And so we call those vertical hoof cracks. Um, and what they are generally is um, either from a, a hoof horn being really dry, um, which we certainly have happened when we're, you know, in a drought situation or whatever, we ha can have a really dry hoof wall. Or some animals have poor hoof quality. They're just the horn of their hoof is not great quality. Um, and that makes it easier to break down. So what happens is my cup is a hoof again. Um, if that hoof wall is very dry or again of poor quality, when that animal walks, uh, you know, down in the pasture, they're going to rock that foot over like this, break over, and pick the foot up and they're going to set it down and that you know that's how they're going to walk well as they do this that puts upward pressure on the front side of that hoof on each toe and that can form you know that pressure can make those cracks occur and they're just like cracks in concrete they're going to just go all the way until they're to the end so you know the reason that you section off your front porch with concrete um uh with with grid lines is so that the crack stops eventually. And so what we do with those, if you get them to us soon enough, and let's say this is the coronary band, if that crack is only up to here, we can clean it all out. Sometimes there's manure and infection underneath there. We get it all cleaned out and then we're gonna cross hatch it just like you would concrete to get it to stop. And that's the goal. Um, I will tell you in my experience, once an animal has vertical hoof cracks, they're going to have them. Um, but we can try to get them stopped and we can make some changes. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll shorten up the toe so that when they break over, it doesn't have as much pressure. So if this is real blunt, they just break over a lot easier. Um, and we may have you do feed additives like biotin and zinc and some other things like that that we know are really good for hoof health. So Dr. Jones, um, we've got I've done a couple of things. Dr. Lawman, I got, I got your email. So I went ahead and put that link for the Angus foot score guidelines in the chat. So if anybody wants to take that down, um, you're certainly welcome to. And then we're, then we're sharing these, these guidelines. Excellent. Thank, thank you for doing that. Yeah, I'm not sure why I couldn't get it to share, but uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jones, we need to update your Joe's cup collection. Giuseppe's oh yeah, this is vintage collectors though. Day. Yeah, it's that's this is a really true. expensive one. That has some value now. <laughs> Regardless, that's a good point. would you comment on the uh, divergent claw? I don't know that I've seen, I've seen much of that. And what do you anticipate with that condition as far as uh, creating lameness? 
Yeah, so uh, just so to clarify for everybody and myself, you're referring to like those one, two, three feet down yeah, at the yes, bottom? Yes, so he's saying divergent claw, so those two claws are diverging, um, as, as the name might suggest. Um, we really don't see that either. Honestly, where I see feet that look like that the most is when they have a corn in between them. Um, you know, most corns will cause about a three and maybe down at a two, depending on the size. But if you think about the way that foot is going to ride on the ground, if it is spread out like this, there is going to be more wear on that mm -hmm. inner or what we call the axial portion of the claw. And so you can see that those are kind of tipped up a little bit and you're going to get more wear on the basically on the inside portion of each claw. Um, and so I can envision a situation where um, it might predispose to axial groove cracks, which um, unless you've got a picture of a foot right in front of you, I would not expect you to know where this is. But in there is a little crack that's a natural anatomic crack. It's supposed to be there. It's a kind of it's a groove, not a crack. I should say a groove. Um, but sometimes we will see that area crack and I could envision that that would be potentially a pressure point for like a, especially a number one foot. Um, and I could also see, uh, where it would potentially cause toe issues again, sort of on the inside out at the toe, um, where there is cattle are meant to kind of walk. If this is the shape of a hoof and this is the kind of the inside, this is the outside. They are meant to bear weight up here and out here the most. They are not supposed to be bearing weight in here at all. There's not hoof wall there for them to walk on. That's, this uh -huh. is all supposed to be concave. And so if all they're supposed to be walking on is this business out here and they are like, you know, and they tilt like this with a divergent claw, they're gonna be bearing weight in places that, you know, God never intended to bear weight. Um, and so there's a number of things that could happen with that, but I could, I could envision toe ulcer issues and I could envision axial groove, you know, issues. Very, very good. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Jones, we got time for one more question. Sure. Uh, talk to us a little bit and, and then we'll close up because I know you've got appointments uh, to be seen. <laughs> Langness so, uh, is the best. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about sand cracks and do sand cracks have a, a genetic component to them? Yeah, so um, basically take um, a lot of what I told you about vertical cracks and you can kind of apply that a little bit over to sand cracks too. Um, so a, a sand crack can really occur anytime that hoof wall again becomes dry or brittle. Um, they can form um, after some kind of inner injury to the hoof, um, there are just a variety of things that can get those started up. As far as, um, you know, there potentially being a genetic component to that, the only thing that I could, excuse me, really say with any confidence about that is it's, it, a lot of it comes back to hoof horn quality. Um, and there certainly are, you know, uh, animals that have really nice hoof wall that's really tough. It's like, you know, you know, some people that have really strong fingernails and, you know, they don't break them off or whatever. And then, you know, people that have really thin fingernails. Um, it's kind of that same thing. The difference between a really um, high quality horn that is likely to resist cracking versus horn that may be thin and weak. Um, the issue, of course, is that there are environmental factors that go into that and nutritional factors that go into that. So being in a very dry environment, for example, it's why they're called sand cracks. Um, that can be an issue. Again, I talked about zinc and biotin. The trace minerals are critically important um, to hoof health qual and quality of that horn. Um, and then in some situations, there may be a genetic component to that as well. Um, but the problem is, you know, you like so many things, you've heard the term multifactorial disease where there's a lot of factors coming into that. It's hard to tease out in any individual animal or in any individual herd to say, this is a genetic issue, this is a nutritional issue. But the best you can do is come in and say, okay, we're gonna change in the environment what we can change, which oftentimes isn't a lot, you're either dry or not. 
and but we can intervene nutritionally and potentially offset you know the contributions of the other two factors all right dr jones we are right at 1 30 and uh, i'm sure uh, the reception is trying to get that may have been the things <laughs> that we heard uh, getting a hold of you so we appreciate you spending some extra time with us uh, this afternoon definitely want to thank all our attendees uh, yeah. really across Oklahoma as well as our out-of-state attendees. Uh, we've, we've had veterinarians, veterinary students, and, and producers on the line. I um, want to thank Dr. Lawman, of course, for putting these uh, Ranger series together, and uh, we will see everyone next week. Uh, I'll be with you talking about effective veterinary client-patient relationships, and so hope you'll join us again. Uh, as you close out today, we do have a survey, depending upon where you sit in the mix, a veterinarian, veterinary student, or producer uh, for our integrated beef cattle program that we are, are launching. So if you have a moment, it'll take you about five minutes or so if that, if you have time, we'd sure appreciate that input. Uh, you can take a look at the polling results. I think they've, I think they've been shared. We'll share them again one more time, just in case. And um, with that, Dr. Lawman, do you have anything else? Dr. Lawman, you were muted, so yeah, I think I, that's probably a no, but. No, I, I just appreciate Dr. Jones' outstanding presentation today. Look forward to seeing everyone next week. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great, great Thursday, and uh, we will see you again next week. Thanks, everyone.